Today we are reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off and at once traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of the slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's word. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we are so grateful for this third Sunday of worship series of focusing on gratitude. Sometimes it's easy to see what we don't have and harder to see what we do have. Extend our eyesight to see how blessed we really are. Open our hearts and our ears to hear a message in spite of the messenger. May we grow together and may we learn together. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm, I'm hearing myself, so I just need to know I'm getting feedback. So I don't want to feel schizophrenic. <laughs> it's getting a little hard. So we're on our third week, our third week, and this week the sermonic theme is speak, speaking truth to power, speaking truth to power. Virginia Walden Ford was a part of the youth that desegregated the South. It wasn't really her choice, it was more or less her dad's choice, but her dad used to always tell her, don't be mad, change the world. Don't be mad, change the world. Virginia was shy and reserved, but she felt she had to do something when she saw her youngest son falling through the cracks in her inner city school in Washington, D.C. 
She felt like if she didn't do something, she would lose her son. He made a complaint about his math class, and so she went to see the math, math teacher. And upon talking to the math teacher, she realized the math teacher did not even know her son's name. That startled her. The teacher had a classroom of 42, but the fact that she didn't even know her son concerned her. Her son kept expressing to her that get good kids get beaten up. And he started aligning himself more and more in the community with gangs. She was crying one day when a neighbor who had left and gone off and been successful returned. That neighbor <laughs> offered her a partial scholarship for her son to attend a private school. And so Virginia picked up another job because she needed to help keep her son in this school. She noticed immediately a difference in her son. There was a light in his eyes. He started to relax. She wanted to keep her son in this school. He was doing better. He was starting to seem like he was getting his glide. But she looked around in her community and she saw other kids that were struggling. And she began to look for answers. She found in another city the school voucher program that had produced positive results. It's a really kind of political thing. But she had found in this city that it produced positive results. She thought it might be the answer for the kids in her community. And even though she was shy and not used to talking, she felt passionate about this issue. And so she began to talk. And people ignored her. And she began to talk to school personnel. And they dismissed her. And she began to speak to the powers, school boards. And they dismissed her. And she began to knock door to door, calling other parents and neighbors to speak up for their kids. And they began to go up on the hill and talk to political people. And she fought for 20 years, taking parents to the Capitol in 2004. After years of activism, Virginia secured legislation that gave thousands of impoverished, largely minority children access to safe, high quality schools. Many of them since have gone on to college and rewarding careers. And the outcome would have been unimaginable without the educational boost of Virginia's law provided. I want to talk about one more person, Rob Bilek. I don't know if I'm saying his name exactly correct. But he was about to make partner at Taft, Stettinus, and Hollister when he got a call from his grandmother. And a neighbor of his grandmother noticed that his cows were dying. He was a cattle farmer. He had 200 cows on 600 acres of property. And now his cows were mysteriously dying. And he believed that his neighbor, the DuPont Chemical Company, was responsible. This farmer had tried to seek help locally, but discovered that DuPont just about owned the entire town. So Violet agreed to see him because he thought it was the right thing to do. And of course, this was something that his grandmother wanted him to do. Violet was an environmental lawyer, but he was not the kind of lawyer that this man needed. He actually represented the corporations, and he even had worked with colleagues on a couple of DuPont cases. He was helping corporations to comply with new laws, and he felt that his work was valuable. But then he met with the farmer, and the farmer had taped video after video of these cows and how these cows looked deranged and how some of them were charged. He took videos of black teeth and cutting their heads and their bodies open and looking inside and seeing that their internal organs were different colors. And as this lawyer began to look at video after video, it was like watching for him a horror movie. The videos also showed a pipe running into a creek, discharging green water bubbles on the surface. Now this farmer intuitively knew that DuPont's chemicals were killing his cows, and he had tried to speak truth to power, but it managed trying to speak to a DuPont company that makes millions upon millions of dollars. 
He has said that he knew all along that this stuff was bad, but he just needed someone to help him to take on the powers. Well, in 1999, Violet filed a federal lawsuit against DuPont. And guess what? It would take decades for Violet to get any justice. Even today, Violet is still fighting DuPont Company. This is where we enter the biblical text. I'm talking today to you all about speaking truth to power. Sometimes when we speak truth, to powerful institutions, it is hard work, it is courageous work, and it sometimes takes years and years of engagement. So we enter the biblical text today, and you just heard it. There's this slave owner, and he's about to go out of town, and so he entrusts his money to three of his slaves, according, he says, to their ability. The first slave he gives, Five talents, and talents means money. Through the generations, the church has translated this to mean our gifts, but it actually just means money. He gives to the first slave five talents, and the guy goes and he is able to, you know, cause that money to double. And so when his master comes back, he's able to then give him ten talents. He gives to the second guy two talents. And he's able to double the profit as well. And when the master comes back, he's able to give him four talents. Each of these slaves, maybe they were fearful of their master. Maybe they had a hard work ethic. Maybe they wanted to please their master. Who knows? But they're able to satisfy the slave owner. But this last guy, this last guy who's categorized as lazy, and thrown away and tossed away this last guy. Well, he was mad with this last guy because when he came back, this guy had not increased his profit at all. This made the slave owner mad. I left you with one talent and you haven't done anything with it? Oftentimes we think, yes, if you don't use your talent, it'll be taken away. But I'd like to challenge you to hear the words of the marginalized guy with the one talent. He says, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Did you, did you hear that? This man is telling his boss that he's a hard man. How many of you just told your boss, even if you thought that, <laughs> you are a harsh man? He speaks that to his boss. In other words, he's telling his boss, you're not a nice man. He's telling him, you make money where you have not invested. You are not a fair man. You are not a good man. You are not a man of integrity. I mean, we could go on for a while with the yous. So I'm giving you back what is yours. Parables are stories with layers. Maybe today we can hear beyond this man's fearfulness. We can hear him in spite of his fear, speaking truth to power to his boss. We know that does not end well for him. It doesn't end well for a whole lot of people that speak truth to power. But this is about the Amazons of the world. This is about the Walmarts of the world. This is about the Trumps of the world that don't pay one single bit of taxes on billions of dollars that are made. This is about the 1% in our country living way, way better than the rest of us. And I know I'm going down a road I probably shouldn't go down, but what does somebody need with 28 rooms and eight bathrooms and seven cars? Here is a man who did not labor or work hard or roll up his sleeves, but he's making money anyway off the backs of others. Jeffrey Epstein had homes and islands and lots of cars and molested lots of teen girls. And because of all his money and power, no matter how much truth the lady spoke, it took over a decade 
to speak truth to that power. Speaking truth to power is risky business in our country and in our world. Things don't end well for this slave. We read today how he's treated because he simply spoke the truth. So I don't want to overlook his words. I don't want to call him lazy. I want to hear the prophetic message of his words and the courageousness he pays dearly. Speaking truth to power back then was hard, but it's hard now because people with power use money and lawyers and money and lawyers and lawyers to squeak their way out of the evil they have committed. DuPont knew that it was unleashing damaging chemicals into the environment that caused so many people illnesses, and they covered it up. That is power, and that is hard to speak to. There is one more who spoke truth to power, and that's our guy, Jesus Christ. Y'all remember? He came along. And we learned two weeks ago, he challenged the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He spoke truth to the religious institutions. Who is this carpenter that talks to us in this way? Who does this guy think that he is? And the more he talked, and the more he spoke truth to power, the angrier they got with him. They went and caught a lady one day, not living her best life. And they bring her before Jesus and say, according to the text, she should be stoned. What would you do? And Jesus pauses and he seems to be thinking about something else when he looks up at them and says, he who is without sin cast the first stone. In other words, he who is perfect, you go ahead. You go ahead and stone her. I love this text and I love what happens next. This lady degraded and humiliated and objectified is put on front street for them to make a point to Jesus. But his words strike gold, and one by one, these men leave. They leave silently. They don't say another word. He looks up at the woman and asks, where are they? Where are your accusers? They're all gone. And Jesus says, hey, you too are free to go, and you're free to live the best life that you can live. Jesus knew how to speak truth to power, but it made the powers that be angry. Oh, they got so angry with him. They were boiling, and Jesus would just give it to them. And then they plotted to kill him. You see, speaking truth to power is dangerous business. Ask Malcolm X, ask Martin Luther King. Ask Bishop Romero, speaking truth to power is courageous business. We like all the stuff about grace, but this is a part of our call too, to speak truth to power. So what does all this have to do with gratitude? Each of us has been given privilege. There is so much privilege in our church, and we've been given power. We've been given a voice so that like our ancestors and present siblings, we can speak truth to power. This is a part of our call. It's not the part we like as much. We can be petty. We can talk about the most petty things. But then when it's really time to speak, we are quiet. I mean, really, sometimes the church can be petty. Sometimes the church can be very negative, but when it really, really counts, we're silent. When the aid epidemic came, the church was silent. You could barely hear our voice. Let us join with our sisters and our brothers in Christ who have spoken up and spoken out. That is a point, that is a call on our lives. Last week we saw that our vote matters. But this week, we need to be reminded that our, our voices 
matter as well. When God is the author and the finisher of our faith, our voices matter. Last week we were challenged to do what? It's a test. We're challenged to share the all, right? Yeah, they're like, yeah, 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 pastor. Yeah, good, good. We're challenged to share the all. And so this week, we receive the challenge to be the voice for those who are often not heard. Join Miss Virginia in speaking, not for her kids or our kids, but for other kids that are our kids because we see that kids are being lost through the cracks. Be the voice for the people in unhealthy job conditions that threaten their health. Be the voice on transgender awareness a week because we know that there's more violence done to transgendered people alarmingly in our country and we are quiet. Be the voice for those who have fled the violence in their own communities and have come to these United States of America and find that we don't want them here. Let's be the voices for kids in the Boy Scouts, the church, the homes, the institutions who were sexually and physically violated. How did that happen? Because not enough people were willing to speak truth to power. I was reading Memorial Drive by a Pulitzer Prize winner poet, and she shares that when her mom got beaten the first time, she went to the teacher and the teacher was like, those things happen. And she knew as a child that she was on her own. When we see domestic violence, oh, we don't wanna get involved. Speak truth to power. Let's be a voice for women who are scattered and better. The world needs our voice. I don't hear enough Christians that see a radical call of the gospel to be an agent for the marginalized people in the world. The world needs our voices, not on the petty stuff. The world needs our voices and our bodies and our presence. These big Corporations are worshiping a God, and it's not the same God that we worship. But sometimes you wouldn't know it. And they care about money and wealth and wealth and money, so much so that they will unleash chemicals that they know are damaging people for money. And yet God calls us over and over and over to care for God's sheep even the one that's lost. Let's care and shelter until we find a cure for the virus. The 1%. Let's be a voice for those that get stampeded. The one that is unheard, the one with special needs, the gift that God has invested in us is not just for us. And so I say as we Realize how much we have to be grateful. It's not just good enough for us to covet it for ourselves. The gifts that God has given to us, the talents that God has given to us are not just for us. They're for our brothers and our sisters that are out there in the world. And out of that deep gratitude, we exercise our voices for those who are falling through the cracks. We speak truth to power, even if it knocks us down. I have spoken truth to power, and I have gotten myself knocked down. It is risky stuff, but we speak truth to power. We take the privilege that we have, that we have been given, and we speak truth to power because it is the right thing to do. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that you have been so gracious toward us. We thank you for your faithfulness toward us. We thank you for the Virginias 
and the lawyers and the people in our world who know it is the right thing to do to speak truth to power. Help us, Lord, to align ourselves with organizations and groups that are working to combat the evil forces in our world. Help us, Lord, on a daily basis to recommit to placing the lives of people, the quality of people's lives first, even as we try to combat this virus. Lord, be with this community, continue to lead us and to remind us that we are not powerless and that the talents and the powers that you have given to us are to be used in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>